So now we're getting to the core message of this section. Our unfettered sin leads to social and economic ruin. C.S. Lewis said, Surrender to all our desires obviously leads to impotence, disease, jealousies, lies, concealment, and everything that is the reverse of health, good humour, and frankness. For any happiness, even in this world, quite a lot of restraint is going to be necessary. And there are just two ways of putting restraint on the inherent sinful nature that leads to ruin. Number one, the restraint can come from within our own hearts by the Holy Spirit's power. In this way, we will use our freedom to make good choices, to be generous, kind, honest and loving. Number two, if we don't restrain ourselves and society starts to crumble, the government will try to restrain us from without by imposing laws on us that will take our freedom away. They will take the Pharisaic route. They will try to use law to force us to act responsibly. Now the first way, letting the Holy Spirit rule within our hearts, leads to freedom, prosperity and health for a nation. The second way, having the government pile laws upon us, leads to tyranny, corruption, disease and poverty for a nation. Edmund Burke said, Men qualify for freedom in exact proportion to their disposition to put moral chains on their own appetites. Society cannot exist unless a controlling power is put somewhere on the will and appetite. And the less of it there is within, the more there must be without. It is ordained in the eternal constitution of things that men of intemperate minds cannot be free. Their passions forge their fetters. Again, the stark choice is either God, by his Holy Spirit, rules within, or secular powers will enslave from without. Unfortunately, our governments don't know much about God or his Holy Spirit, and they are so blinded by political correctness and relativism that they are unlikely to facilitate the reintroduction of God into schools, hospitals, workplaces, halls of power, law courts, and most importantly, into the hearts of men and women around the nation. And so they take the only remaining option available to them, the second route, the legalistic route, the Pharisaic route. They impose ever stricter laws on the populace in a desperate attempt to get them to stay in line. The Roman historian Tacitus rightly said, The more corrupt the state, the more numerous the laws. You can tell when a state is crumbling because the government are desperately trying to hold the whole thing together by throwing laws at it. And that's what's happening today. Now when a society has laws thrown at them, what happens, at least initially, is that the people just try to find loopholes that will allow them to beat the system. Plato got it right when he said, Good men do not need laws to tell them to act responsibly, while bad people will find a way around the laws. Here's a couple of examples of what I mean. In England, Scotland and France in the 18th century, a window tax law was introduced, whereby people had to pay tax based on the number of windows they had in their house. Did the people pay the tax? Of course not. They simply bricked up some of their windows to avoid paying the tax. They found a way around the law. Eventually, there were so many bricked up windows that the citizens started developing health problems from the lack of sunlight reaching them in their windowless houses. The law didn't make people behave in the right way and it didn't change their hearts. It just created new problems that needed new laws because unregenerate people just found a way around them and sickness ensued. In the Netherlands, a tax was introduced on the width of the buildings. Did the people then simply pay more tax? Of course not. They simply built their houses extra narrow and tall so that they would have the same amount of space without having to pay the extra tax. The government created laws and the people found ways around them. It has always been this way. As people find new ways of getting around the laws, other laws are then needed to close the loopholes, and then more laws are needed to define those loopholes, and so on and so on. Before long, people are buried under a mound of oppressive laws, and no one has really changed. At this point, another phenomenon starts to kick in. The people become increasingly resentful and rebellious towards the government for their restrictions, interference, and oppression. Ultimately, when the government has thrown enough laws at the problem in a bid to control and restrict the behaviour of their citizens, and when the civil leaders have become just hypocritical enough and corrupt enough with all the power that they have grabbed from the people, and when they have become just oppressive enough and tyrannical enough that the people can take no more, there comes a point where the populace decides it is time to fight back against their rulers. This takes the form of marches, petitions and protests, and if those don't make a difference, it can even lead to full-scale rebellion and revolution. 
Thomas Jefferson thought that revolution was all part of a necessary cycle, saying, The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time by the blood of patriots and tyrants. Power would eventually corrupt all government to the degree that a periodic reset would be required. Such a cycle may also remind us of Alexander Tyler's model too. Our selfish sin leads us into dependence on the government who are corrupted by the power and who put the citizens into bondage and then what follows is always an uprising. The people are forced to fight back to win the freedoms that were taken from them. We're starting to see this kind of resentment in our world today, particularly since the economic crash. The foundations of global civilization are beginning to shake. Citizens are turning on their governments. They're taking to the streets in protest. Governments are becoming more brutal in response. Animosity is growing between the ruling class and the masses. A two-tier system is developing. Indeed, it seems most likely that what we are witnessing are the beginnings of the tumultuous birth pains prophesied in the Bible. Those terrible times where tribulation comes to the world on a global level prior to the return of Christ. Never forget that at its root is the problem of godlessness. When people refuse to put fetters on their own sinful nature by the Holy Spirit's power, sinful ruin and legalistic oppression automatically follows. William Penn said, If we are not governed by God, then we will be ruled by tyrants. Remember that when Jesus came, his mission was not to impose burdensome laws on us. It was to take those laws away and to give us a spirit that could cure us internally. The spirit would live within us, sanctifying us, curing our heart sickness in the process and automatically causing us to grow in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. We would no longer do the right thing because we were being made to by force of law, but because we would come to naturally love goodness and crave righteousness. By Jesus' stripes on the cross of Calvary, we would be healed from within. And this is something we must understand. It is impossible to have freedom and no possibility of moral evil. If people are truly free, then they are free to choose good or to choose evil. That's just part of the deal. Freedom creates the possibility of evil. But if we take that freedom to choose evil away by law, we take freedom itself away. So then, we want people to be free, but we want them to use that freedom for good. The only way to achieve that is to put people right internally, and that means they need the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we won't need so many laws to rule without, because Christ will be reigning within. Internal heart renovation only comes by the power of the Spirit of Christ. If we want minimal government, minimal laws, minimal interference and true freedom, which we should, we must heal the internal heart sickness and that can only mean Jesus Christ.